All right, guys, here it goes. Georgia, video number two. We're going to the Georgia Aquarium today. We just finished eating breakfast. We're going to go there. Steve invited us over. He's going to give us a tour behind the scenes. We're going to see all the big stuff they got going on. The gigantic reef is I heard it's over 150,000 gallon tanks. I have never seen anything like that in my entire life. I'm super excited, so let's go check it out. Let's go, guys. Steve, what's up, buddy? Doing well. How are you Thanks. doing? Great, man. Thank you for having us over. Man. Thanks for coming to Atlanta. So it's my first time here, and I'm so impressed. I've never seen a reef tank this big. I mean, the biggest reef tanks I've seen, I want to say, is the one in um, Frost Museum in Miami. Yep. I've seen the 12,000-gallon um, tank in SeaWorld. I've seen the 17,000-gallon in Andrew Sandler. Yep. And now, how big is this thing? This is just massive. This, this exhibit is about 50 feet by 50 feet by 18 feet deep at its deepest point. It's 164,000 gallons. Wow, this is just a lot bigger than I ever dream of, you know? So how long has this tank been running? So we've been open since uh, 2005, and then we actually started the exhibit a little bit before our opening date. So it's wow. been going for quite some time. Uh, what are the biggest challenges you normally encounter on a tank this size? Well, because it's so big, there's a lot of challenges associated with it. Maintenance is a bear. Um, you know, we put divers in here four days a week, okay. and it will take them about an hour and a half just to clean the window. In addition to that, we have to do a lot of coral maintenance. You know, as the corals grow into each other, just like with smaller home uh, hobby aquariums, um, you have to cut the coral and do all that stuff. So we have divers that do that as well. Um, gotcha. And then just some of the, you know, maintaining some of the equipment. The, the lamps need to be changed on the metal halides. Uh, the calcium reactor needs to be refilled. Um, so it's just a ton of work doing all the maintenance associated with this exhibit. And now, like you were mentioning, trimming corals. For instance, you see the cabbage leather down there all over, and then it came from the rocks. So the corals here, once they start growing, they almost become like a weed, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the corals, uh, as they grow into each other, like to kill each other uh, to make space, to make room. So, right? Yeah, it's a battle. So we have to kind of mitigate that in an aquarium setting. So we get in here, we're using a lot of the same equipment that maybe you might use at home, uh, coral trimmers. Um, we, we actually use hammer and chisel underwater to break up some of the bigger corals. We'll use uh, saws and we have underwater power tools as well. So we have underwater power drills uh, angle grinders, all kinds of stuff that we have to use in a dive setting. And we're doing this, you know, without just our hands in the water. Um, so that adds a, another layer of uh, risk and um, uh, a lot of work. So for every diver we have in the water, we have one person up there watching the air supply and another person that would manage emergency in case uh, something were to happen. Um, and then in addition to that, we're getting blown around when we're in here from all the water flow. So it's not like just yeah. when you're outside the tank and you have your feet on the floor and you're kind of nice and stationary. You have to be an expert diver to get in here and be able to not crush into, crash into all these corals. Yeah, and buoyancy, right? Just trying to float the right way. Yeah. As we're talking right here, we see someone cleaning the glass. Is today the day, I'm assuming? Today, today's the day. So they're getting in there. Fortunately, it's been cloudy the last few days. So okay. we have a little bit less algae than we normally do. Uh, but you can see they're using a magic eraser and a uh, pro scraper. So again, nothing super fancy, very basic tools. Uh, right now, we just have the one diver in here. Um, we can get up to about four divers in this exhibit at one time. All at once? Yep. Wow, it's, just, it's almost like a pool, like a giant pool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, it, you know, it'll take, they'll do kind of a lawnmower pattern and kind of go and hit up the entire window. So it, it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. It, Got you. Where else in Atlanta can you have a dive like this? Yeah, exactly. Where? Yeah. Just here in the Georgia Aquarium, right? What's your most aggressive coral, will you say, here? Most aggressive? Um, well, fastest grower, I should say. Yeah, some of the styloforas or stiloforas are very fast growing. So we have, uh, I'm sure a lot of your viewers might be familiar with uh, Milka stylo. Yeah. Um, that one's a great coral, very, very fast growing. Um, 
even our Acro, this guy is an original. This predates Believe me. It, I right? got here in uh, 2010, the tricolor Acro. Um, we have, of course, the Kinoporas are pretty aggressive. They can send out sweepers. La Melosa, right? Uh huh. And then um, the, the Monis get huge. They actually, one of our main aquarists has trimmed this. That coral was over uh, eight feet across. And it was actually sagging the, the support structure because it was so heavy. So our aquarist got in there and gave it a, a massive trim recently. Um, so a lot of the corals uh, grow really, really quickly in here, but just like any home aquarium, there's corals that do well and there's corals that don't do well. Um, so we have to kind of find what's gonna do right, uh, do well in this particular exhibit and kind of lean into those corals rather than trying to go against the grain and trying to keep stuff that might not do well. Yeah, because this tank you mentioned is 18 feet deep. Yep. So to deliver flow, you're not gonna get the best flow in every, in every space in the tank and you're not gonna get the light to penetrate as well every single space. So it's yeah. kind of like, it's, it's a different challenges that you encounter in a home aquarium. Yeah. Average home aquarium is what? 24 inches to 36 inches average? Yeah, yeah. Two and, to and, three feet tops? When we're designing this exhibit, we couldn't exactly just go to another exhibit that's, that's similar and base a lot of our equipment and methods off those people. Because when this was designed in 2005 or even earlier than that, there wasn't many exhibits of this size out there. Um, so, you know, whereas in a home aquarium, you might be able to get inspiration, go online, go to your store, see another 90 gallon or 180 gallon t uh, aquarium and base your equipment cho uh, choices off that. We didn't have that luxury. No. It's like you started like from the beginning. It's not like you can consult with someone else with a tank this size. Yeah. I mean, even the big tanks that I've seen, they're in the range of 10 to 20,000 gallons. They're nothing compared to 150, 160,000 gallons, like you say. So this is a whole new territory that you, you discover as you go, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, took us, it took us about 10 years to really dial this exhibit in. And that's about on par with the other kind of mega reef exhibits that exist out there in the world. So. For the first few years, you know, this is made out of concrete. The concrete leaches uh, uh, certain substances that make it a little bit difficult to maintain some of the corals in here. So that leaching process can take a few years. And then it's just about dialing in the system. So it's a much slower process than it would be, be at a home aquarium where you might be able to get that, that aquarium dialed in in a few months. For us, it can take years. And on the cement part, will you do it again or will you do something different if they were to rebuild the aquarium? Yeah, you really have to use the, the concrete or cement once you get into an exhibit of this size. Um, some of our other exhibits will we'll use fiberglass as well. Yeah. Um, but once you get into the, just structurally, you need something that's, that's massive for this. Gotcha. So look, they're still cleaning this glass. They don't stop. Yeah, they don't stop. And, and we actually have a volunteer program here. So these guys, volunteer their time, believe it or not, to get in here and clean. Um, but like I said, this is one of the few dives that you can get in in Atlanta. So they kind of hone in their skills and you can see they're not wearing normal dive equipment. This is called surface supply diving. She has an emergency di uh, air supply in her back, but the majority it. of her air is at the surface. Um, and then she's able to, because she's diving alone, but she has a buddy at the surface with their own separate gear. So should she have an emergency, one, we can try to get her out of the water using that, that umbilical, that lifeline that goes gotcha. to the surface, but they also have a separate set of gear that they can uh, don and, and jump in the water to, uh, to rescue should that, should that situation occur. So a lot of steps taken for the safety of the divers is very important, right? Yeah, very important. And it's a full face mask for that communication, but also to protect them. We don't have anything in here like Pelithoas that might uh, have some toxicity to them. Um, so fortunately we don't have that, um, but they still have all that protection on them. We have lots of Didyma sea urchins in here that can spike people if they're not careful. Um, so we, we still have to have a level of caution. We only put the, the best divers that we have at the Georgia Aquarium in this particular exhibit. We even have to watch where we're breathing and exhaling our bubbles. So we so don't want the, trapped, under the, the trapped under the corals and they can actually damage from the force of the bubbles as they make their way to the surface. So there's a lot of things that we have to do that you might not um, think of in a, in a home aquarium setting. So a couple of questions. You got so much fish in here. Do the fish pick up some of the corals? Is there someone? Yeah, and there's certain corals we can't do. So some of the fleshier corals that you might find uh, in the hobby, the acanthophilias, the euphilias, fimbrophilias, um, those guys we tend not to have a lot of luck with. Um, we do have a lot of copper band butterflies in here for 
um, Aptasia control, Mahano anemone control. Um, but in addition to that, we have some uh, raccoon butterflies that tend to pick at some of the corals, Klein's butterflies. I don't There's, see the raccoon butterfly, where are they? Um, there was one just at the surface. There's a threadfin butterfly. Okay, I see him. Most of the fish do very well in this set, uh, setting because there's all kinds of nooks and crannies for them to hide in. Um, and then we picked, we're, we're pretty wide ranging in what region we selected. So it's all just Indo-Pacific fish um, from all over that region. And then we of course try to choose aquacultured fish whenever we have the opportunity to do so. Most of these guys are kind of our, our janitors, our workers in here because we only have so many divers uh, and we need to control algae, we need to control aptasia, mahanos, um, hydroids, uh, all the different pests that you might have in a home aquarium. We have them and we have them uh, in a bigger setting. So we have to really uh, balance this ecosystem with all those uh, that natural pest and uh, algae control. Each fish that is in here, is there a log for that? Like yeah, we have a computer database, so we can we know exactly what fish went into here. Um, but of course, as you might know, like in a in a home aquarium setting, uh, can they they can die and they can disappear so fast yeah, in the reef you setup. Don't know so uh, we we do kind of log what goes in and what goes out, um, but we can't fully uh, know what fish have died at, at what point in time. But a lot of these fish were actually added between 2005 and 2010. Gotcha. So most of them are old. I have blue linkia stars in here that we added around uh, 2011. They've been and still around. Still around in here. So oh, uh, we have we have turbo snails that predate me when I got here in 2010. Giant monsters. Giant. Those things yeah, you are find from, them around just moving rocks and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And they're 2007, 2009. So these guys live a long time. That's cool. And do you have an estimate of how many yellow tanks are in here? Um, I don't have the exact count, but it's somewhere around 300. That's so cool. You ever seen them? They're, they're lower. They don't really school together, just everywhere. Yeah, they kind of just go wherever. There are fish, these uh, fusiliers will kind of um, um, shoal together at times. Um, and it just depends on the time of the day. Uh, they're a little bit, you know, they have a diver in the water right now. So their behavior is a little bit altered than what you might see. Uh, with the diver out of the water. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll get natural spawning in here. We just added a bunch of uh, these lineatus wrasse. There's about a dozen of those guys in here. We have cleaning stations that were set up. We have cleaner wrasses over here. You see a lot of coral spawning too? Uh, we don't mimic a lot of the environmental parameters that might cause synchronized broadcast spawning. Yeah. The brooding species like uh, Tabastria or Tubastrea, those guys will spawn. Uh, in here, and then of course, Bacillopora, everyone knows those guys are like weeds. Oh yeah, they just spawn all over the place. So they'll, they'll spawn, um, but we have not witnessed uh, bro uh, broadcast spawners going. Of course, they could do that in a um, non-synchronized fashion, but I've never witnessed it personally. So another question, I see those tongue corals down there. Those, uh, you started with one or you just added a few of them down there? We added several of them, but as they break, if someone accidentally uh, kind of steps, on, steps on them or whatever, they'll turn in and they'll fragment into multiple. We also, with the, um, with the, uh, the fungias, the plate corals, those guys will have the anthocalis that, that uh, turn into a bunch of different babies. Uh, so we have those as well. We had one that was killed by a clownfish that buried it in the sand. Oh. And then it, it, from that one individual polyp, it turned into 30 or 40 or 50 individuals. Um, so we have a lot of that going on. We actually uh, will we'll propagate within the system. And then I will show you guys something that most guests don't get to see our propagation system upstairs. Oh, cool. We'll propagate corals and then we'll add those fragments into here. I see a lot of clamps and you got them here all the way to the bottom. They're doing fine, just fine with the line penetration? Yeah, and keep in mind, so we have natural sunlight, so when that sun is oh, out, um, it blasts light all the way down here. We'll get so crazy that's high. how you're able to make it so deep, because if no, it'll be very difficult to penetrate that deep. Yeah, and, and I'll show you the light structure um, up top here, but we have to get our spacing right on the lights to make sure we have those overlapping light beams to get the punch that we need. But these light fixtures, they're not like you know, uh, a Radeon or an AI blade or something like that. We're using 1,000 watt metal halides and 500 watt LEDs. So they, they got a lot of punch to them. So another question, do you ever introduce new corals into this tank? We do all the time, um, but when we get a coral from a different facility or from 
um, an aquaculture facility, we quarantine for a long time to make sure that we don't add anything that we don't want in here. Okay. Um, we don't have any major pests in here, and I want to keep it that way. You've been staying away um, from Acropora flatworms? Uh, we have, uh, as far as I know, no Acropora flatworms. We did have red bugs when I first got here in 2010. Um, I pulled the Acropora out here because we had a lot fewer of them at that point, treated them, and then added them back in here once they're uh, red bug free. Um, so we don't have any of those major coral pests. And I really want to keep it that way because, as you can tell, it's we can't exactly just do a whole system treatment in this size. Oh yeah, exhibit. I definitely understand. Well, if you're ever interested, I'll be glad to send you a box of some goodies for free just to donate to the aquarium. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Of course, we're always looking for new stuff. We're up at about 50% coral coverage at this point. We'll try to get a little bit higher than that, but um, because it's that sheer wall, we can't exactly pack them in, in some of these spots. So let's go see the filtration area. Okay, awesome. Sounds good. All right, let's go. So we're top side of the main exhibit right now. This area is available for behind the scenes tours as well as uh, educational groups. We'll take them up here to show kind of the engineering side of things. Um, so we have a lot of our filtration um, up here that we'll go through in a moment here. So we have about 1500 gallons of water that dumps out every two minutes out of these dump buckets. That creates that wave effect that guests will see when they're down uh, in the gallery there. Yeah. That's synchronized with the crescendo of the music um, that plays in that gallery area. Um, and then for lighting wise, we need a lot of industrial fixtures. So we have, say. it's basically stadium lighting that we have over this. We create so much spray from the dump buckets that it tends to ruin a lot of the equipment up here. So we need to make sure that the equipment, any new equipment that we're trying out can handle the environment. Um, and then in addition to that, we need to make sure that the LEDs can provide the punch and the spread that, uh, that we're used to out of the, the metal halides. Yeah, it's not easy, especially when you say the tank is 18 feet deep. It's 18 feet deep, so it's really tough to get light punched all the way down there. In addition to that, we have natural sunlight that comes through our skylight. I see so that. that. that supplements the lighting to a certain extent. We're having a lot of difficulty though. We can't get metal halide uh, lamps in like we used to. Huh. So this is the future going to uh, these LEDs. Very interesting you're saying, it's hard to get a hold of metal highlight bulbs nowadays. Yeah, there's- I mean, the Ushios, the radiums bulb that we used to get, they're no longer available, right? Yeah, we can't get a lot of those in, so we're actually stretching out how long. Um, we we t would typically replace the lamps every six months, but we're having to get more than a year because of that uh, limited availability. Yeah, you have to squeeze it, right? Exactly. Um, this is our lagoon, so this is attached to the main habitat. It shares all the same water. Oh, wow. Uh, but most of the fish can't get back and forth, but the small ones can. We do have um, some two of the blue spotted stingrays in here, and we have uh, giant clams, uh, Tridacna gigas in here. We have magnifica anemones, bubble tip anemones, and then of course red and black mangroves. And again, this area is only visible to guests that might come on a behind the scenes tour or part of an educational group. It's one of my favorite things right now, just watching this lagoon, these giant mangrove trees here, they're phenomenal. I'm looking at your NAMS over there, your sea urchins, your, your zoas right here. Yep. I mean, the anemone, the clowns. Yeah, we're actually, we've gotten rid of most of the fish in this lagoon portion that we're really picking on coral. So we're looking forward to modifying this in coming years and really focusing on this lagoon section, making sure we have the right uh, equipment, uh, the right fish components, and then getting some of those fleshier corals that we might not be able to display in the main deep section of the reef. This one's actually used and we're trying out this fixture. This is a Kessel W2K. It's 800 watts. Oh, wow. That's all you're using here. Yeah, and then it gets the natural sunlight. That's still very strong. I mean, I can see it looks like a highlight down there right now. Yeah, but this is illuminated. We have carpet anemones all the way on the other side that do great just with that, that natural sunlight. And how do you keep the sand so clean here? We get in here once a week and we kind of gravel wash. Gravel wash? So how do you we'll, do that? So we can't use gravity like a normal home aquarium. We have to use a pump. So we have a one horsepower pump and it spins the gravel around similar to a normal gravel wash process in a home aquarium but then it filters it and returns the water back to the main exhibit rather than using a gravity and using that to um, go down the drain. We actually recycle the water. Okay, cool. So this is our main coral propagation area. This one's about a thousand gallons. We grow coral in here, take fragments of them, and then plant those into our main habitat with scuba divers. Is this connected to your main display? It is not. It has its own separate filtration system, a big MRC Orca Pro um, protein skimmer, 
big MRC calcium reactor, has a little bit of a refugium with a red mangrove in it. And then um, this one actually has 16 radions over it. So we just transitioned uh, because of the metal halide lamp issues that I mentioned. Yeah. This one we just transitioned to radions. Uh, we'll see how long they can hold up in this environment um, with the fans that they have. Um, what generations are these? These are Gen 6. Six. Um, this one has a few different, it's got MP60s and then the Hydro Wizard ECM uh, 63s. Um, and we're just trying out a CJ Voyager pump in this uh, exhibit right now as well. So lots of flow. Uh, I turned it down so that we could film in here. We do have a few fish in here. They're meant to just uh, pick at the algae. There's sea urchins in here, there's shrimp. All the typical components you might use in your uh, reef aquarium at home, we include in here to help control the algae and make it a functioning ecosystem. So let me ask you a couple of things again about the big aquarium here. Yep. Let me ask you a little bit of the maintenance. Do you guys do water changes? We do. So once every week, we do a backwash on the sand filters. So you see the two big blue vertical yeah. towers? Those are basically giant pool filters in them. Once a week, what we'll do is reverse the flow in those so that it shoots the waste and we shoot that uh, wastewater down the drain. So that typically gets about 4,000 gallons of water that goes down the drain and then replaced with new um, RO salt water every single week. Every single week, so about 4,000 gallons. Yep. So it's not a lot. It's not a lot at all. Um, it's a very so small percentage. It's very difficult in these big enclosures to have very meaningful water changes. If you were to have an emergency, What's the biggest water change you could make? Are you, are you ready for a 20,000 gallon one, 20,000 gallon one? Yeah, we are ready. We have a giant reservoir um, and we can actually uh, do flow through water changes in here so we could uh, drain the, the water uh, that way. So hopefully we don't run into that issue, um, but we are prepared salt water wise uh, to, to do that. Most of our bigger exhibits where they have things like big sharks and, and other animals that are not as sensitive, uh, we just use uh, dechlorinated city water with the instant ocean salt in it. Okay, and a couple more questions. Where do you keep your nitrous and phosphates on a system like this? So our nitrates are about 40 ppm in this. Okay. And our phosphates, depending on how you test it and what you believe, are anywhere from non-detected all the way to 0.2 parts per million, okay. depending on which test um, but it's you want to believe. It's, it's relatively low in here. We actually don't use anything to control it anymore. We've used lanthanum chloride in the past, as well as ferric oxide to lower the phosphates. Um, but because of that, um, that really low level, what I've done is increased the feeds in here, uh, got rid of the other uh, phosphate mitigation techniques that we've used in the past. Now, can you tell me a little bit about your feeding regimen? Yeah, we're feeding this tank about four times a day. We feed nori. We feed these things called grazing logs, which look like green donuts that we add to the exhibit. Um, we also feed all your typical frozen food items you might feed, um, mysid shrimp, uh, pacifica krill, uh, calanus, um, fish eggs, all those different stuff, as well as uh, flake food and pellet food. Okay, cool. And then one more question. We're standing in front of these giant mangroves here. You ever deal with those little white bugs? Yeah. How we, do have, you we have scale. We, yeah, get it's in here, it's cool. we get in here by hand, so we can spray the trees with salt water, and the salt help, helps kind of keep them down. Wiping them down with a, with a little rag. We like can do that leaf. as well. A, a little alcohol swabs yeah. will help as well. Um, so all that is done by hand. Hi, right, can you show me some of the rest of the filtration? Yeah, let's go take a look. And um, you know, we thought that calcium reactor over there was big. This this is. Uh, this is uh, quite a bit bigger than this. Um, this one holds two pallets full of uh, arm extra coarse media. This is a Neptune Benson vertical sand filter that we converted. So as it gets fines and other debris in it, or if we had new media that we want to rinse out, we can actually backwash and reverse the flow and flush all that stuff down the drain. Um, we have a pH monitoring system on it to keep our pH around 6.3. Okay. Um, and then this dumps out about two gallons per minute of calcium and alkalinity rich so water. So it's just constantly it. running. It's constantly running. So instead of having a little drip, this thing's dumping out two gallons per minute of that media. And it, after about a year, it will lose about half of its media. Uh, oh, so into it lasts a year, you don't have to replace it about once a year. Once it gets about half full, just like I recommend with smaller calcium reactors, then I'm adding another um, uh, bit of media. But in this case, it's a whole pallet full to take up that half of the, cool. of the filter. We have a, a calcium hydroxide or Kalkfasser container here. We drip this in. The advantage of this is it helps raise our pH. Um, 
and it uh, adds a little bit more of that calcium alkalinity boost. It's also great because it can help precipitate phosphate out. So we also have other filtration that's not just for the reef exhibit up here. Um, now we're getting into the main reef filters. This is a sand filter. There's one and then there's the second one over here, okay? Those help do the mechanical filtration. So keep in mind, just like when you look on a peninsula tank through the long side, we have it even worse because you're looking through sometimes 20 or 30 feet of water to where you really notice the water's cloudy. Yeah. So these help keep it clean. We also have two RK2 protein skimmers where we inject ozone into it. Yeah. So you can actually see the ORP inside the, cal uh, inside the protein skimmer, okay. that 386. We have multiple redundant systems in place. And then the uh, these protein skimmers dump into, uh, it's basically like a giant wet dry filter, yeah. um, but it, it helps get rid of the ozone that would be toxic to the fish. So that's really the main filters in this. It's very simple. Uh, Bruce Carlson, when he designed it, wanted to mimic what works in the home aquarium hobby. Yeah. Because home, home aquarists were really at the forefront. They were uh, uh, of, of pushing reef aquarium husbandry techniques along. This really covers most of it. These are our big pumps. So a lot of the pumps we're gonna, we measure in horsepower, right? So once you get into these big things, uh, we're turning over this system every about 40 minutes. So all the water goes through our filtration system every 40 minutes. So you Not might bad. see in a, in, a, in a home setting, you might be trying to turn over your tank. We used to say, you know, in the 90s times. and, and 2000s, we were saying, 10 to 20 times now we're more reasonable do maybe five times yeah because we got power heads now yeah we don't do anything like that in a, in a public aquarium setting because this is electricity this is money all right this is the aquaculture room okay. we're about to actually renovate this and turn this all into atlantic corals so control. these are the this is the rescue program from the floria keys yeah unfortunately there is a uh, there's a disease going on right now the stony coral tissue loss disease and it's wiping out a lot of the corals there it's a disease that affects about half of the stony corals um, throughout the Caribbean, and it has nearly 100% mortality rate. So it's a critical situation that's going on over there. Um, and a normal disease outbreak, outbreak typically lasts only about a year or two. This has been going on since 2014. So it's a, it's a, a critical situation that's happening. That's what's so important that in all the animals, it's gotta be strictly fish from the Caribbean. Yep. All the critters, the rocks, everything. Yeah, nothing. and the people that work on these exhibits don't work on the Indo-Pacific stuff. They don't even touch nothing else. We don't wanna cross contaminate. All the rock was collected uh, in a certain way, quarantined in a certain way. Same thing with the cleanup crew. So really simple setups. We have XR15 um, lights over them. That's so cool you guys working on this program as well. Yeah, absolutely. We, we, uh, we actually sold our old farm to um, SeaWorld, Disney, and ACA. They got together. Yep. They're the ones holding the most corals. That's literally two miles from our shop. Have you visited the facility yet? I have not visited it yet, but I work closely with those guys. It's a very, uh, it's a network, a yeah. community of people, and we help each other out. We don't have the books. We don't have the online forums. No. to help troubleshoot these particular types of corals. So you guys communicate with so, each other what's working, what's not. Yeah, once a week we meet with them um, uh, through an online meeting uh, and um, we kind of talk about what's, what, makes, uh, what works with these corals versus where a lot of us come from an Indo-Pacific background. Yeah. So I used to work at a pet store. I used to, uh, I, I am a home hobbyist. Um, so I know it works with Indo corals. I don't necessarily know what works with these Caribbean corals. We're not, too, we're not experienced different. with these. Thank you for the tour, man. We appreciate it. You're doing a fantastic job around here, man. It's great to have you. Yeah, hopefully uh, you can come down for Reef of Palooza. I would love to show you the store. Maybe go check out Justin across the street. Go check out the old farm where they're working with all of these corals. 
It's literally, so you got SeaWorld, you got World Wide Corals, the Coral Rescue Farm, yeah. all within five miles. It's like a coral mecca down there. I'd yeah, love man. To go down. So again, thanks again, right. buddy. We appreciate it, man. Thank you. All right, guys. I really enjoyed the Georgia Aquarium. I hope you guys did too. I'm in the bottom. I'm underneath in a tunnel under the 6.3 million gallon tank. It's the biggest aquarium I have ever seen. I saw tons of cool stuff. That giant reef tank, they got 160,000 gallons. I've never seen anything like it. Lots of education. Uh, if you guys are in the Georgia area, come visit them. I highly recommend it. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to give us a like, post some comments below. We'll see you guys on the next episode.